Marriage conundrum, I think, refers to the fact that in most of the time in medicine, we sort of establish diagnoses and perhaps, um, you know, disease manifestations. And then it takes us years and sometimes we never really come up with effective cures or treatments for those diseases. And in Barrett's esophagus, over the past two decades, we've developed a variety of resection ablation techniques collectively known as endoscopic eradication therapy, which can actually eradicate the Barrett's and dysplasia in probably in excess of 90% of patients um, with proper technique and persistence. Our challenge, though, is to help identify which patients actually have the condition that we can apply these essentially curative techniques to. And that really, I think, highlights the fact that we have difficulty in screening patients to find out who has Barrett's. And then even in those whom we have identified Barrett's, we have a hard time detecting dysplasia to identify prevalent disease as well as very little sort of understanding on how to predict which patients may develop future incident disease. And I think those are the key areas that we really can make progress in um, to try to help funnel those patients to the effective treatments we've developed. And then finally, <laughs> to sort of further complicate things, we also have sort of challenges with anatomic landmark description. Um, and so we have mislabeling of patients with Barrett's which leads to wide um, ranges in risk estimates and perhaps a false underestimation of the true risk of patients who have Barrett's esophagus for developing esophageal cancer. I think the role that tissue cipher can play in these sorts of uh, conditions is to help with that area where we're trying to figure out if the large number of patients who have non-dysplastic Barrett's which of those patients are actually going to go on to develop dysplasia so that we can intervene early while they're still non-dysplastic rather than waiting for them to dysplasia or worse, having them dysplasia, develop dysplasia and then miss that dysplasia because we are not adequately sampling or not recognizing those early signs of dysplasia and then have them come in and present later on with a more advanced form of cancer. So that's really, I think, the goal is how do we sort of do that. And then likewise, perhaps if we could develop a similar strategy to identify low-risk patients, we could also perhaps uh, have them have less frequent surveillance. And so there could be a cost savings associated with that as well. Well, I think that um, tissue cipher can be a useful adjunct to a careful visual exam as well as appropriately obtained biopsies and perhaps brushings as well. And this can also provide information either about completely non-visible disease or perhaps even serve um, as a backup, you know, in identifying patients who may be showing signs or perhaps even have subtle dysplasia that may not have been caught by a random biopsy or a careful visual exam. So I think these are all adjunctive sort of technologies to help us piece together the picture in the best way possible to identify those at greatest risk for developing soft adenocarcinoma. The patients that uh, I see in my practice usually come with a concern of dysplasia. Uh, and so one of the challenges I have is to confirm whether that dysplasia is in fact accurate. So we often review outside specimen or at least make sure that uh, the specimen that were obtained were confirmed by expert pathology. Um, secondly, a lot of patients come to me uh, with a question of whether they actually have Barrett's because they may have misclassification um, from biopsies taken across the Z-line and so forth. Uh, and then really the other question that we often wonder is, is there actually more disease than there may be present? And uh, you know, sometimes someone will come in with high grade, but we'll see an obvious nodule or concerns, and, and uh, there have been several studies from the Netherlands that show that patients who go to expert centers often have far more advanced disease than was initially recognized um, at their index endoscopy. If someone comes with a high-risk tissue cipher score, and has non-dysplastic Barrett's. I think it's also useful to identify their clinical risk factors that are associated with progression. Um, and that could be, of course, 
a family history uh, of esophageal adenocarcinoma? What is their segment length um, of their Barrett's? Uh, you know, are they a smoker, uh, for example? Um, you know, is there any history of prior or dysplasia that may be present? Um, and I think uh, those are some useful factors, and all of those things are actually associated with an increased risk of progression. Uh, but, you know, the data that has been obtained so far suggests that if you have a high-risk score, even without dysplasia, that may be uh, equivalent or greater, in fact, uh, of a risk to patients who have confirmed low-grade dysplasia by pathology, expert pathology review. And certainly it's my practice and, frankly, the practice of, of most uh, of my colleagues to treat confirmed low-grade dysplasia in 20, you know, 2022. And um, if we were to apply that same level of risk, if we're re willing to treat that level of risk, then to me, it stands to reason based on the data that I've seen that certainly in patients who also have clinical risk factors, it would be reasonable to have a conversation about offering eradication therapy to those patients with a high risk tissue cipher score. Tissue cipher really is part of this umbrella of what we're moving to of precision medicine, right? We, we have traditionally slapped the same guidelines on a huge number of people and, you know, we've treated patients with non-dysplastic Barrett's with a half a centimeter or a centimeter of Barrett's, I guess, to officially meet the criteria, um, similar to those with 14 centimeters. And I don't think uh, a one-size-fits-all approach is probably the ultimate best way to sort of manage disease. And uh, obviously, more recent guidelines are providing nuance about three years for surveillance for longer segment Barrett's, more than three centimeters, five years surveillance for shorter segment. But I think this can take it to another level. Uh, and that if we can say, look, this is a group of people that have a high risk score, should actually undergo treatment, um, or at the very least, you know, increased surveillance, uh, or on the other hand, have attenuated, you know, have a low risk score and can undergo attenuated surveillance. So I think uh, this sort of, you know, makes a, a more refined approach uh, to doing this. And I think could actually provide benefits on both ends of the spectrum, avoiding cancer in high risk patients and the costs associated with that and avoiding intense surveillance in people who have relatively low risk and probably don't need it. You know, as clinicians, we always like to try to get as much evidence as we can to help us make our decision. And what Tissue Cipher provides is really uh, a combination of 15 features, uh, many of which include biomarkers, uh, and not only, you know, just the biomarker, but perhaps uh, a level as well as a ratio between these biomarkers, which has then sort of been computed by uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, and then combining those biomarker information along with uh, anatomic changes, uh, you know, in architecture uh, that perhaps uh, may be actually quite subtle and may not be at a level uh, of anatomic abnormality that would even be traditionally called as dysplastic on anatomic pathology but still represent a level of aberrancy within what would be traditionally non-dysplastic appearing tissue. Uh, and then combining these anatomic features with sort of the biomarkers um, and, and again coming up with an algorithm uh, based on ratios and levels uh, to best sort of predict, um, you know, the progression to dysplasia. And I think sort of the synthesis again is combining multiple features uh, to sort of create uh, the potentially the most accurate way of predicting when dysplasia will occur. I think that uh, the future is exciting for the field of Barrett's. Uh, as I said, we've actually got great treatments. We're just trying to find the right patients to undergo those. I think uh, coming up with a screening test that is easy to administer, perhaps even non-finished physician administered, um, and is broadly acceptable by patients uh, will be the first key step. And my suspicion is that likely that will be non-endoscopic, whether it would be some form of a blood test, salivary test, or perhaps a cell collection device-based test uh, remains to be seen. But I, I think something like that will then trigger patients with a positive test to undergo an endoscopy for confirmation. Uh, and hopefully we'll find uh, more of these patients early on uh, and then subsequently, patients will undergo surveillance programs, which will involve detailed uh, BOPSI protocols, as well as perhaps brushing, uh, the use of artificial intelligence perhaps to look for areas of dysplasia, which could help them target their BOPSIs and brushings. And then those specimens collected 
could undergo uh, some form of molecular analysis, such as tissue cipher, to further put them in stratified categories, which would then predict future surveillance or the need for endoscopic eradication therapy.